Hello everyone, I'm Carol Allen Story and welcome to the Frontline Club series, Looking at the Still Image. The program features the influence and the impact of the still, photog still photography. And it includes themes from iconic imagery, through to humor, the influence uh, of minorities in photography, photojournalism, technology, festivals, and so on. Today's theme is uh, 21st century photography trends. Our conversation with the panelists will explore being experimental, embracing taboos, the unlucky of shackles of traditional interpretation of how a photographer expresses their art, and the wider conversation, as everyone will be joining in, uh, is the views of publishers, gallerists, and organizations that promote the work that can be controversial, experimental, and give emerging artists a voice and a platform, which is unusual. I'm delighted to introduce our very entertaining and highly talented panel. Ian Rogers is the Director of Photography and Operations for the agency Weber Represents and Weber Gallery. Prior to that, she was the Chief Operating Officer of Magnum Photos. Fiona is the founder of Firecracker, a platform supporting female photographers and authored a book published by Thames and Hester, Firecrackers, Female Photographers Now, Celebrating Contemporary Women practitioners. Haley Morris, uh, Haley, I'm sorry if I don't pronounce your last name properly, please forgive me on that, is part performer, artist, part provocateur, art spectator. Haley explores the act of reflection in her photography. She is a multidisciplinary artist. Her acclaimed book, The Bully Pulpit series, investigates the social phenomenon of cyberbullying in the age of Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And apparently, people that are these bulliers are characters hidden behind their computer screens, their telephones. Some people bully others and have done so for years. Othello D'Souza Hartley's artistic vocabulary encompassed vocabulary, film, performance, sound, drawing, painting, is all encompassing. His work, uh, his work crosses many multiple platforms and his practice is concerned with ideas around the human body as a site of embodiment, often taking inspiration from classical painters and art and historical tableau. Recently, Autograph commissioned the fellow to create a work in response to the wider context of COVID-19 pandemic for their project, Care, Contagion, Community Exhibition, which we'll tell you about when we get started on our talk. Hannah Watson is the director of TJ Bolton Gallery and the acclaimed publishing house, Carly Books a dynamic meshing of art space and a publishing platform representing emerging British and international talent. And curiously and interestingly, often showcasing artists that have not yet exhibited in London before. Othello, before we start with you, because I'm going to kick off with the conversation, mm -hmm. I would like to screen a short film that Othello uh, directed and then we'll get into the conversation. Yeah, so I directed it and started it in two, 2018. Okay, so let's kick off. Would you show it, Sandra, please? Thank you. Oh, it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> The first British ships arrived in the Caribbean in 1623, and despite slavery, despite colonization, 25,000 Caribbeans served in the First World War and Second World War alongside British troops. It is inhumane and cruel for so many of that Windrush by what you see, the choice you have to make and ways to discover what it means to be black in New York. I don't know how you feel when I hear black in New York. I know what it means to be black in New York. Said my hair was a tool and once bit, just cut my hair off. And once bit, just cut my hair off. Okay. 
I discover that those songs, darkies, sang and sing were not just the innocent expressions of a primitive people, but extremely subtle and difficult, dangerous and tragic expressions of what it felt like to be in chains. All right. Othello, tell us a little bit about um, what the inspiration was for this film and uh, how it, it, it is a linchpin, um, perhaps, in your other work, if you run through it for us. Okay, so in my work, it's, um, they said I'm attracted to references come from paintings. Even my photography references uh, originally came from painters. Um, and sometimes in some of my photographic work, I conceptualize um, social social stories or things, topics that come up or things I read about or through conversations. So the interesting thing when this piece was made um, in 2018, it was an interesting year because that was the year that Edward Enfold became the um, editor of British Vogue. That was the year that Virgil Abdu became the artistic director of Louis Vuitton. But at the same time, you had Eric Garner in America that was killed. He was selling cigarettes. Um, but on that particular day, he was actually breaking up a fight. So he was killed in New York. Um, then you had in Pretoria in South Africa, um, black girls being sent home because their hair is natural. And then the great speech by David Lammy, the um, MP for Tottenham, um, that same year when it came out that um, people who came during the 60s and 50s and say the 70s, who are part of what they call the Windrush, uh, Windrush generation, were being sent back. So there was a mixture of Caribbeans and um, particularly and West Africans who were being sent back to the country, mainly Caribbeans, but also uh, West Africans as well, who were sent back, who had been living in the country for a number of years when England, when those countries were part of the, uh, the British col um, colonies, um, who were uh, brought up under the British education, they came here um, as British citizens, and then it came out in 2018 when it became um, known that these people were being sent back to their countries that they've left maybe 20, 30 years ago, sometimes 40 years ago. And then in between that, there's um, also, so I, I put together all the material, and it's also, so there's an interview with Virgil and Nomi. Obviously, you heard David Lammy's speech. Then uh, Akala, who's a rapper and, and the cultural theorist, his voice is in there. And then the interviews with the girls in, in South Africa, and then finished with a piece from but, James you know, Baldwin. I, I understand, you know, it's funny that you said it's James Baldwin, because when I viewed it for the first time, and I, I, and I want to invite everyone else in the conversation here, I, I said, I know that voice, because I'm a mm. big fan, as you know, of James Baldwin mm. uh, and his, well, who and what he did and what he, yeah. he had written. But, and I will say I worked with an amazing, will say I did work with an amazing artist um, from New York called B. Smith, who when I was working on the piece, I asked her to get involved because she's an amazing, she did the camera work and helped with the, did the editing. She's an amazing um, artist who worked with me on it. Okay. Well, the, the, the point, mm -hmm. uh, the reason I wanted to show that film first uh, was to open the discussion that, you know, there's a, a, a mixed marriage, uh, uh, and I, I welcome everyone to, to, to chat a bit about it, of, 
fine art, you know, it, it's not the still image, you know, it's a film and you do do the, the stills a, 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 as well, that also has a, a, a voice about what's happening from the social uh, uh, impact uh, in, in the world. You know, you were talking about a lot of different things that were occurring that were your influences aside from yeah. the and so on. And the impact it had on people mentally, you know, particularly people, friends that I know who opened up and talked about all these various things. It's like you're making a step forward, but there's 10 steps back and how it affects you mentally. And that was part of that, the, the collapse in the end. Well, you know, well, I'm opening up, you know, Hannah, uh, j just to put the question to you, you know, you, you're seeing, the, what are you seeing in terms of the marriage or the collaboration? I think it's a marriage almost of taking fine art and, and, and especially Haley, the kind of work that you do. It makes a real statement about, you know, what's happening uh, in the world and it's bringing together the artistic uh, execution with a voice about an important subject that needs to be chatted. In fact, let me, uh, uh, Hannah, if you could break uh, off and talk about that, and I would love to hear your voice, voices as well, uh, Haley and, and Fiona. Oh. Well, I mean, in the in trolley, we we kind of that was our what we got known for is publishing important social political stories um, that were done in beautiful beautiful books. And sometimes it was a little bit difficult for people to even see a book that was so beautifully designed and produced and and have such horrible um, uh, you know stories that needed to be told so there was also that kind of strange clash sometimes with producing beautiful art thing objects uh, around human human misery and the the dark darkest things in the world but also that's why it's important i mean i think the artists i mean if we're talking about art art has to say something and do something for me it's not more it's i mean that's why i work with someone like Haley, because it's it's not about, about making beautiful pictures uh, in photography. It's about really saying something that's so interesting, so clever, so well done. I mean, I let Haley talk about it more, but I think that that's, I mean, for me, that's what I look for all the time. I don't want photography just to be something that's aesthetic. It has to really hit you in a very important way, whether it's a visceral reaction or an, an intellectual one, or or a social one or art can move you into many different ways of feeling and being but it has to do something otherwise it's not really it's not really art so you, yeah. well I mean and I think it's kind of a, a form of an activist voice for I know me and uh, you know lots of people who who uh, work with these kind of subjects and and just so you know the the way um, just putting that on the wall and giving it or on the page or, or giving it an audience in itself is another form of activism. And, you know, it can be just as impactful as being, you know, at a, you know, at a protest, you know, with placards screaming at the top of your lungs. This is um, a different type of voice. And uh, it gives, you know, kind of meaning to what the, you know, maker is trying to kind of change, um, you know, just, so many different voices out there are trying to create social change through art and their art practice now. What do you think, Fiona? Um, I think that, you know, if we look at the sort of uncomfortable history that photography's occupied, you know, it was essentially a colonial tool, right? So I think that there's been a lot of, um, I think there's been a lot of analyzing that and, and looking at that, you know, if we're going to sort of talk about trends in photography, I definitely think that, you know, Black Lives Matter obviously had a huge impact on the way in which photographers were responding to things like agency and representation and, and, you know, and, and reclaiming the black gaze. And I think that, you know, that's obviously very much what Othello's work is looking at, at doing and, um, you know, amazing, amazing, well, I, predominantly sort of think about female photographers, but people like Nadia Blas and, um, you know, Woodland Cadley, you know, that, those sorts of photographers that are, are kind of, yeah, looking to to reclaim the gaze. And that's essentially what Haley's work is also trying to do. I think, think there's, you know, there's lots of parallels in that. I think, I think 
as well in terms of um you know the the medium itself and that sort of uncomfortable history i think there's you know a lot of people finding that photography maybe feels a little bit reductive in some of these sort of activism spaces and you know i know for Haley that performance element of her work is really critical you know that yes it may end up being a photograph that's the that's the let's call it the legacy of that work but for for Haley and and i i i don't know about othello but you know that part participating and creating that work whether it's a sort of video piece or whether it's the performative art or the, the what Haley's doing but i think that that's you know, a way to respond to maybe the sort of reductive nature of like the 2D, the 2D-ness of photography maybe feels a little bit, mm. feels a little bit restrictive when you're trying to talk about such big subjects. But you know, uh, and you, uh, the reason I find this really an interesting conversation is the idea of what the artists are doing today, that they're breaking some of the rules that they're entering some of the taboo corridors, if you will. And they are giving, I think, and I would love you know, your thoughts and we'll look at some of the uh, more of the work, is that it's a much more powerful platform to, to, to discuss what's happening socially than just running around in, 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 with a placard and saying, you know, uh, conservation today and this tomorrow. It was just more memorable and, and, and it's lasting. And the power of photography and the power of the art of photography, I'm finding in today's world it is even stronger than it's ever been because of the breaking down, you know, the barriers and, and, and so on. We'll get. We'll return to that. Adela, do you want to show us some more of your work? Yeah, if everyone wants to show, start the um, the slideshow. So, um, starting off with uh, a commission I got from Autograph Gallery, um, based in Shoreditch. Uh, it was a commission that came through in, in April last year. Um, my father passed away in March to COVID, and I immediately after he passed away went into went back to the house after my mum came to stay with me because she didn't want to be in the house alone. And I took my camera instantly. I didn't use social media to announce that my father died. It, he was quite a private person. So am I quite outside of my work, quite a private person. And um, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I just knew I wanted to pick up the camera. And I picked up the camera and started photographing his objects. Um, and then what happened about two weeks later, I got a commission from Autograph and um, we discussed what I was going to do. And also I work across different mediums and I thought there's a great chance to how I can translate one project across different mediums. So I went back over a number of periods with a medium format camera. Um, my dad had his own room. There's a little funny story to that because my mom got fed up with him watching Netflix all the time. So she got me to convince him to go into uh, one of the other rooms in the house. And that became his room a year before he died. Um, and this is my way of dealing with grief. And I just went back and photographed his, his room in different objects. And I would say this was one of the most challenging projects because obviously I was dealing with grief. We can move to the next image. Um, I literally went through seven rolls of films before I got to the place that I knew what I wanted to do. Um, and then if you go to autograph gallery, these are, these are uh, quite a large triptychs um, sat alongside each other. Um, and this is the images. And this, like I wanted to reference him through his objects, so the hat, he likes wearing hats, and he had an alternative way of thinking. So I used the book, one of the books that he, he read a lot, which is about alternative thinking, about the world and stuff. And I placed those things. And then obviously I used the, the body a lot in the work, and which, which is interesting because this was the first project. I felt like it was very difficult to place my body into the images. But then after, like I said, after about seven rolls of going back over a number of weeks, I finally, in discussions with Rennie, the curator, I finally was able to achieve that and as well as going over the grief. So one, it was a way of dealing with grief, um, but also homage to my to my dad. Okay, so um, I like bodies. Body, the, the, my interest in bodies and performance comes from, and this wasn't me in this picture, the, it comes from a performance background. When I was a teenager, I was in, interested in performance and I've also wanted to merge this gap between performance and photography, and it started with the Masculinity Project. And I did this this piece last year 
it, for, for Pitts Hanger. Um, I, I was thinking of like sculptural pieces and the body, which is a kind of a hint to a project that I'm working on right now, which is called A Silent Key Laws of Power, where I'll be working with like a seat, like about 50 dancers in a space. Um, but thinking of the sculptural aspect and using the body because of my fascination with the body. Um, yep, okay. Um, this goes back to more like the social thing again. I was, this project is called Reclaim the Skin. I did it, this was the picture done in 2018 and I've only just got another person who wanted to take part in the project. This was kind of like issues around dark skin and how dark skin is perceived in other cultures, um, in some Asian cultures, also in the Caribbean and some parts of Africa. And it was my way of calling it Reclaim the Dark Skin and the beauty in dark skin. Um, by keeping it very minimalist and just using natural light and really thinking about the issues that I've grown up with around issues around um, dark skin, not just from the black community, but also li listening to stories from around the world from other communities, how dark skin is kind of seen as not as attractive. And also if you look at the fashion industry now, which has changed and how darker skin models are now being seen on the, on the catwalk. This was kind of, again, my summary to things that I've been hearing about over a num number of years. Um, this project was uh, 2017. Um, there's a whole talk about uh, black women and their hair, and I think there was one picture with Lapita when her hair was cut for, a, for Tat I think it was Tatler magazine. And again, stories I've heard about the issues of body image, not just also about being a black woman, but also body image, um, the black woman, natural hair, um, also how if you cut off your hair, how you're perceived, your sexuality is perceived. So again, loads of conversations with female friends. And then I, I created this piece based around that and then interviewed all the women. And again, thinking about the work, there's, if you were talk, I mean, I think it was Hannah who was talking about, not Hannah, um, got the, from, was talking about the aesthetic side of the work. So once there, one, there is a social sort of side to the work, but also outside of the work, I have an interest in brutalist architecture and architecture. So if you look at a lot of my spaces that I shoot in, either abandoned spaces and try to create a harmony between the sitter and the environment. So this was again, you, you can slide through these. And I guess I interviewed and photographed women from all over parts of the world. One was from Nigeria, one was from South Africa and various sizes, um, uh, skin tones of different women of color. Oh, yeah, okay. So, sorry, you can move on. All right, so this is the last um, project about masculinity. Masculinity was my, my, my longest project I did. It lasted um, from 2010 to 2018. Haven't completely given up on it, but it was challenging contemporary issues around masculinity. But this particular picture, again, some of the work is not just political, but also conversations. So one um, exhibition I had in 2017, I'd met a guy who works in banking and I've always wanted to, to explore trade fraud. So I did working class men in the North. And I always wanted to find out, not just talking about working class men's culture and masculinity or black men's masculinity. I wanted to understand the men that we perceive as the men who in uh, the gold standard. So I remember at an exhibition, there was a guy kept coming in and out of the exhibition. And then he called me and we met him in Chelsea. And he described to me what it's like working in this kind of environment and the mental health of men working in this environment, which is not the, the kind of perceived images that we get of men who work in these kind of environments, because usually it's about the, their, their income and their social status. Um, and he opened up to me about the mental health he suffered and he spoke to his bank and I got into the trade floor to do this, to do this, um, this picture in, on a trade floor. And it really opened up discussions between him and the bank because he had a discussion with obviously his bosses and talked about the men who suffered mental health in this industry and the massive impact that the ego and all sorts of things and the impact it had has on them and he spoke about his self having a breakdown. Can we just run through this? Yeah. Uh, coherent of the, uh, you know, the work that you've done on masculinity, which you said is over the last eight plus years. Mm. Uh, I'd like to now open up the conversation with everyone else to talk about um, a lot. You know, so much of your work is related to the body, and 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 to and to uh, 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 things that are related to a, a social issue. 
uh, masculinity and how you define masculinity. And getting back to what our, our talk is tonight, which is about trends, what is happening in 21st century uh, 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 photography? What, what is it all about? Um, what do you think, you know, Haley, you know, looking at, at, at this kind of imagery, because you also photograph yourself with a very different theme about this being a kind of a trend of, and I hate to use the word identity because it's over abused and, and, and used, but the definition of masculinity in the 21st century and how it's depicted and what the challenges men may have uh, as how it's, uh, uh, how it's explored and, and, and shown through, through the eye of a lens. What, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I think what's, what's interesting is, like, I think it's fine to talk about identity and it is kind of a cliche that is often used a lot, but what I think what makes it unique, uh, you know, with the Thel's work and, you know, uh, a lot of really interesting things that are happening right now is people trying to find new ways of showing that. So like starting with the word identity and trying to just find different ways of visual, uh, visualizing that. And, you know, through juxtaposition, juxtaposition and space with the body um, is particularly, you know, interesting because if you, you like that was, I'm not gonna say was not allowed, but in terms of how, you know, you challenge those spaces um, and you challenge those different kind of notions, um, that is kind of a new way of looking at identity in itself. And did you think this is a, you know, a, a open to this question and talking about trends, you know, going that we are now in the 21st century versus what was happening in, in, in the 20th century. Uh, do you think that people are more open? Uh, they're not afraid to expose their vulnerabilities. I mean, what, what would you think, uh, uh, Fiona? Yeah, I, I think I think there has been a, a shift uh, in terms of the art world and, and looking a bit more at, you know, more sort of insular or, or private um, situations like, you know, Othello mentioning mental health or Haley's challenge, challenges around body positivity. Um, you know, the, the gaze, I think that's something that's definitely sort of shifted over the last, well, I'd say probably even just the last two years. Um, you can see that there's a, a, a marked difference between who was telling whose story, you know, five years ago to even two years ago, you know, that sort of very kind of colonial view of the world where, you know, white photographer goes around photographing poverty or, you know, the black body or whatever it might be, but the you know, women, you know, that that is now, I think certainly started to shift, um, you know, into a more positive space where the right people are telling the right kinds of stories. And, uh, and a lot of it is, you know the, the lived experience, and I think that that's that's really that's really encouraging. I think that's a great. Uh, sorry, can I just say I think that's a great point. Is that the inclusiveness is that you get in stories from people from different backgrounds, not just race but genders. I think that's really important. So other people are telling the stories and telling their own stories. Agree. And Hannah, what do you think? Um, yeah, well, I think photography always is kind of a reflection of society because it's basically a tool that you pick up and you 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 use your eye to see what you want to see and how you see things so it's a kind of it's a, a physical way of capturing what goes in people's minds and into their eyes so um yeah it's 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 um it kind of just makes sense that for example Haley's work would not have existed 20 years ago without the internet, without Instagram, without online. So it's, it's sometimes it's interesting to think about, okay, if Hayley was working 50 years ago, what project would she be doing? Othello, if you were working, you know, you know, 50 years ago, what would you, what would you be doing? So it's, it's, it's kind of <laughs> 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 I, you know, it's, it's interesting, Fiona, what you had raised a, 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 a just a slight issue and, and something that I, I, I think is really important is, you know, it used to be, well, not used to be, it still is, a, a significant percentage of photographers are male versus female. And the thing that, you know, that has always really gotten up my nostrils on a very personal basis is the objectivity 
of how men show women. You know, it's always their view. You know, they, there's an advertising campaign for a particular uh, uh, a photographic product. The photographer is standing behind the camera and the woman is always the object. Now, why isn't the woman behind the camera? <laughs> and, uh, but I think that's, you know, uh, that, I guess the question that you know, I'm raising to the floor, it, it, uh, uh, can, can we change that? Are, are, are the trends, what do you think? Uh, that's, you know? that's, that's changing too. I mean, that now you'll find with most ad agencies that they have a, you know, they have a triple bid policy where it used to be that you, you know, you had say two, two guys and one girl. Uh, now, a lot of the agencies are now implementing the fact that there needs to be someone from the BIPOC community as well as a woman and, you know, and someone else. Um, so I think, you know, it's always gonna be slow with that sort of industry because it's, it's a behemoth and it's, you know, it's like turning an iceberg, but there's, there's some positivity happening. And I, I think as well, there's, there's a lot more initiatives in those big companies um, that are seeking out to try to change things at, at grassroots level as well. Um, you know, and I think that that goes for the arts community as well. There's way, way, way more that needs to be done. But, you know, I think having a look at what some of the ad agencies are doing, some of the, you know, some of the institutions perhaps, you know, working with um, not just, not just um, people from, um, the global majority, but also having a look at, you know, how do you how do you get more working class people into the arts industry? How do you get, uh, you know, how do you get more people from the global majority to apply for these sorts of roles? And and it's not, you know, unfortunately the work has to be done much 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 earlier. You know, it's a it's a it's something that needs to be done at, you know, schooling era. There's, there's no point in in trying to sort of place people out of, you know, university because some people don't come through that pathway. So, you know, I, th I think there's a there's some work going on to try to re re to address that imbalance. Can but I just say that I also think that the internet's quite powerful, it's particularly places like Instagram. You're getting a lot of young photographers who've got their own audience and telling their own stories and may not necessarily engage in with some of the bigger institutions, but amongst themselves and their peers, they are sharing work, talking about images. And if you look at some of their followers and the discussions they're having around their own work, um, is that whole side of that as well. And there's lots of you know, lots of young people who follow each other's work in discussion, creating work together, collaborating, but like I said, telling their own stories from their own perspective. Yeah. Well, I guess as well, if you've been rejected by the mainstream for so long, then you're, <laughs> gonna, you're gonna go, you're gonna go underground. Yeah. Aren't you? You're gonna mm -hmm. you're find, you know, in entrepreneurial, good, creative people have a way of, you know, rising, rising to the surface. Exactly. Yeah. I, exactly. I think, right. well, Haley, why don't we? Uh, I, I'm going to hand it over to, to you now, and then we're gonna, we're, we'll come back to, into further conversation to explore how these trends, and particularly technology, because technology, social media, has certainly the last 10, 15 years has had a significant, massive impact, I think, and, it's, and very much what you were saying, uh, Othello, is, is really true. Haley, over to you. Okay, uh, well, thank you, and thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Um, so my presentation, uh, it's getting queued up right now, is um, I kind of started with the, you know, my inspiration and where I start, uh, when I'm making work and it's the performance artists uh, basically is, is where I start. And really it comes down to this idea of like Eleanor Anton's carving a traditional sculpture where she lost weight, um, you know, over a period of time. And it wasn't called like weight loss or dieting or getting pretty, it's like carving. And the act of actually using force of removing, um, you know, um, mass from a body, which, you know, those are the kind of uh, visceral words that, you know, I try to evoke in my work. Uh, next slide um, will be um, Yoko Ono. Um, I mean, if you can just imagine, um, you know, being, uh, I mean, we know about her, but what, what interests me is um, being in a room, um, you know, an Asian in a room sitting on the floor and people cutting off her clothes and, um, being in also in that kind of inter interesting, you know, 
dilemma if nobody cuts off the clothes, but at the same time, they sit there and they, you know, cut off all of her clothes and just kind of activating space in that way. Um, the next slide is um, uh, Laurie Anderson's uh, fully automated Nikon object, objection objectivity, um, you know, photograph, uh, turning the camera back on men who cat collar. Um, and then the next slide, uh, kind of jumping forward uh, a couple decades, would be Janine Antoni. And, you know, when I, when I, if you think about asking, you know, what it's like to, to have the, you know, role of a woman placed upon you, I can't, uh, I can't summarize it any more than imagine being standing in a room with a woman on her hands and knees using her hair as a bucket of mop, dipping it into hair color and mopping the floor at your feet. And that, so it's almost kind of like not only describing, but embedding all of these other kind of emotions into it. So next slide. And when I think about the future of photography, it comes down for me to kind of, um, there's lots of things, but if I were to kind of distill it down to a couple of things that are exciting would be um, material and semantics. And so we've got uh, Mari Katayama who, um, you know, was born with this disorder that caused, you know, uh, different kind of limb, um, uh, you know, she had to have her uh, legs amputated and rather than hide its, um, you know, she makes uh, handcrafted, uh, you know, appendages to, you know, to celebrate that and draw attention to that body that normally would be hidden. Uh, next slide would be um, Tara Krajnak, um, again, take using, you know, these masters of photography, masters with such a loaded double, you know, uh, meaning word, but using the nudes and re, you know, photographing them as herself and finishing what Weston kept out, which is, you know, everything else about the woman. Um, next slide. Um, anything, you know, that experience of, um, with Laya real, I mean, what um, she does absolutely magnificently is the, the, the viewer's experience both in the space and, uh, you know, in the book. And, you know, to talk about like rape or abortion, um, she will always present it in a way that it just doesn't tell a story. It makes you kind of feel it. And then the last um, kind of example of material, um, former student Tommy Ka is, um, you know, looking at uh, his Asian identity, but through um, printing, 3D printing and cutting and slicing and um, his own image and placing it and replacing other kind of iconic, um, you know, symbols with his own, um, which I find, you know, really, really interesting. So if we get to my um, work is the first project is um, I'm going to talk about is Weight Watchers. Um, and the uh, next slide, Weight Watchers started with this image. And it was um, just, a, I was doing a project about me in spaces where I ever think about my body, which is whenever you go out socially, you go out for a bite to eat. I grew up in the Southern part of the United States. So there's beaches and pools everywhere. And um, so just going to different locations and photographing all of this kind of um, advertising that was surrounding me and set up the camera, took um, a shot and uh, looked at the film a couple of weeks later. And even though this man um, is in like, you know, a super, you know, uh, sensory capital of the world being photographed by who I remember is an absolutely beautiful woman, um, he seems to be fixated on me. So I thought, well, what happens if um, I carry a camera around with me and just document what people, um, you know, are doing? Um, and so I call them kind of mundane performances. So we can go to the next slide um, where I'll um, set up a camera, do whatever is in the scene, you know, like, so in this case, I'm on the phone with my mom and just kind of take pictures as people walk by me. Um, next slide. And so I... Um, typically uh, we'll set all the camera settings, put it around someone's neck and give them a cue of when to push the shutter. And I don't know what the people in the pictures are thinking or reacting to, but it starts a conversation about the gaze 
and how we use it to communicate our thoughts about others and even how we determine our own self uh, worth based on how others see us. So we go to the next slide. Um, the, you know, I had to travel all around um, to try to get a wide range of people. Um, next slide. Um, because it's not just about one, you know, demographic. And, um, and so it was very much kind of a guerrilla kind of situation where I would go in, um, do a shoot and then leave with like less than, you know, a minute or cause I didn't want to become a spectacle. Um, next slide. Um, and the locations, you know, um, towards the end of the project, I Googled the most vain cities in America. So that would be your Los, uh, Los Angeles and your Miami and your ha Hawaii. And um, so I kind of just did the project there. Uh, next slide. Okay. Uh, you know, in, in terms of what the discussion is tonight about uh, the trends of the 21st century, I would love to know if you would share with us um, what was any of the commentary of the people when you, you, you were having a, a, an image made, you've set it up, you have someone that's depressing the shutter speed. And like in this particular image, there's gals, uh, uh, at, and I know the news cafe in Miami, uh, you know, walking along. Did anyone ever say anything to you or ask you questions when you were undertaking uh, these different pictures? Um, no one ever like asked me, but, and some, some people, um, you know, verbally that shamed me, but I'm not going to say which ones. Um, but, you know, but that was, that was part of it was just kind of being like, you know, a fly on the wall. Like, the reason I asked that because you, you, you were, you're very exposed in doing these setups in terms of the performance that you're creating. And in some ways, Othello also, you know, uh, being totally naked and vulnerable and, and, and these very masculine positions and just curious uh, as to what your thought process was as, as uh, saying, this is what I'm doing and, and it's going to be telling a particular story. Um, would have been done, I don't know. Would Do you think if you had done this 25 years ago in the 20th century, whether there would have been a different response? Um, I, th I think, um, to me actually making the images, um, I'm not sure because the, the, the camera wasn't, I mean, and this is kind of, you know, boring kind of methodic, uh, meth, uh, you know, methodical stuff, but it, the camera wasn't hidden, but it wasn't also kind of obvious. You know, the people weren't looking, you know, the people who helped me were sometimes strangers and they weren't looking in the viewfinder. So it was very much just kind of a, you know, camera just hanging around someone's neck, almost kind of, you know, not meant to be functioning. So, carry on. Yeah. Anyone want to say anything? You know, uh, uh, to ask any question, Kaylee, at this point. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. <laughs> All right, Haley. You can go to the next slide. <laughs> yeah. Actually, so then you know, sometimes um, you know the the kind of uh, actions that happened over multiple frames. Um, I like to show um, sometimes with diptychs, and I think there's a, a couple, one more. Um, and then, uh, you know, the the project basically kind of ended with a uh, the book that was published uh, by the Magenta Foundation in 2015. So we go to the next slide. Um, I was working on the project, you know, I started in 2010 and in 2013, uh, Lens Scratch published the project, and then uh, the next day, Huffington Post published a story on it, and then the next day, Daily Mail UK, and then it went viral, like super viral, um, and it was basically waves of viral for the next two years, which you know was great because you get an audience of you know over two hundred fifty million people. You couldn't you know, you know that's great, but then you also get. Um, you know, things like this. And um, so the first hate mail I got was um, when uh, uh, Huffington Post was published. That's how I found out was that I got this, this horrible email. And from that moment, 
And ever time since, anytime somebody sends me some horrible message, it just cracks me up because of just the waste of time that they're taking to try to get me to stop. So I saved those messages and I wanted to respond to those people. But if I had responded in text, they would have deleted it or, you know, whatever. But, um, you know, kind of two things and uh, a phenomena, we're in a phenomena where an image cannot be removed from the internet. So if I were to want something that could not be um, deleted, it had to be a photograph. And then secondly, if you look at some of these profiles that, you know, it's all curated and manicured. And so their, their own kind of profile is kind of means the world to them. Um, so I wanted to show them, you know, kind of reverse weaponize the internet like they had done. So for the next project, uh, Bully Pulpit was um, kind of my response to the bullies. And so I picked 25 of uh, the bullies. I found their public profiles. I costumed myself to look like them and included their text uh, into the frame. That way my response cannot be deleted. And so if you click through the next slide, you know, when you, um, so basically the, the profile, it's, I mean, we're, when we're talking like I found the profiles, it's like a, you know, less than five minute Google search. Um, but, you know, then studying their profiles after I found them um, and trying to kind of find their mannerisms and then recreate that within the performance of the photograph. Um, so this one says, I just don't get why women allow themselves to get fat. You'll know you'll be treated like shit. Um, you know, recreating, you know, exactly what he's wearing, get his hair absolutely on point. Um, next slide. Um, you know, this was actually the test case because this is a photographer who emailed me um, basically this long email about how I'm ruining photography because I'm so ugly and I just don't realize how ugly I am. And if I just, if I just, you know, did my hair and I, if I just wore different clothes, maybe I don't realize that, you know, you know, he's doing me a favor because I just don't realize how ugly I am, but he signed it with his like full address. Like I didn't have to Google him. So he was my test case. And I thought, well, you know, he's asking for it. So do I want to go where he is? Do I want to do Weight Watchers? Like, what do I want to do? And I realized that, you know, again, um, you know, he's trademarked his name and, and, you know, I could have put his name and address out there in the world and been like, look, look what this man did to me, but that would like sting for like 15 seconds. But this, this is like slow burn and going to like outlive him and out long, you know, forever. Next slide. Can I ask you, do you think the emphasis gave you more, your work more, um, it made your work more emphasis on your work. The topic you're talking about this, the shaming of the work of your, of the body and stuff like that gave it more, more emphasis and made your project, um, more, more a case for, and relevant because of this, this shaming of the, of the body through your work. Um, like, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Like, no, what I mean, if you'd got a different response to the, to the work that you would, to the, you were doing, and you didn't get this kind of backlash and this fat shaming. In a way, doing that in a way has made your your giving your work more of the highlight the issue more, should I say, in the fact that you've got that the shaming for those those people. Right. So there's kind of you know I mean we're talking about so we're not and we also have to understand that like I'm just like a university lecturer like you know making work for a gallery. But what happened when it went on the internet, it got like a colossal response. So I collected 7,000 messages, but there are actually Reddit threads, 4chan, there's blogs dedicated to how ugly and fat I am. Someone tried to start a change.org petition to get me to stop. Like, like, and I, and, and it's not, it's not about me because, you know, again, they just do this to everybody, anybody who's on the internet that they just want to attack, they're going to. And so you know, take, so taking those people and trying to not only teach them a lesson that the internet's not going to protect them. So I use really, you know, poor prosthetics, um, things that are falling off really low, low cost, you know, prosthetics. It's because it's a false, um, you know, protection. Also hope to show people that there is another way of dealing with bullies besides self-harm. So there's, you know, a that tens of thousands of bullies 
There's also thousands, tens of the thousands of positive people who responded as well. That project I'm working on right now, and that's more collaborative, but this is basically like, this is them. And next slide. Just tell the dean up there, because I think this is an important thing for us to, to be discussing is the impact uh, uh, of the internet, whether it's Instagram and you know, 19 year old girls looking to have, you know, two inches chopped off their waist and going to, you know, having all sorts of surgery and so on. Uh, you know, the, the internet, you know, the, the, the Instagram, the Facebooks or whichever one you want to say has had a, a, a massive impact because they could change by different, uh, well, let's put a, a filter over this and let's do this and let's do that and, and, and so on. And nothing's real anymore. And you know the, this project, you know, for me, when I first viewed it, I thought someone is actually making a statement about how dangerous the internet is and and, and what bullying can do, you know, uh, uh, emotionally, uh, the mental health issues, and, and so on. It touches so many buttons. That's why you know when I when I was I was very excited about coming up with this theme uh, of what are the 21st century trends. And, you know, we can kick in them instantly. Oh, you know, there's this technology and that, and we have, you know, we're using digi versus film, or maybe we're reverting back to it. But I, I, I just, you know, I just love the, the discussion we're having now about what you can raise, you know, what, what has happened in the last 10, 15 years. I think that's what I was talking about, Carol, is the impact it has on the audience. Because when you talked about teenage girls seeing this project and the fat shaming you, do, you got for this project, the impact it would have on the other girls and discussions around it is similar to a masculinity project. It brought up discussions from men who were able to come forward and talk to me because of the project. And that's what I was meant the response, this negative response from the certain people, how it will have an impact on the audience or like you said, Carol, younger girls who were probably going through a similar thing every day. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, and that, and I knew I, I wanted to kind of use that, that power that I have to just, I mean, it literally cracks me up when, when these people send me messages. This is a girl that tried to start a campaign that Weight Watchers was Photoshopped and you go to her profile and she has a very large chest and a very tiny waist and very large hips and a thigh gap. So, I mean, who's to say that, you know, her profile isn't, um, uh, Photoshopped, um, a 70 year old bodybuilder who thinks, you know, body shaming is a good thing. Um, you know, and again, inserting that humor, um, to, for kind of, to kind of lighten the, the heaviness of the kind of, cause I know not everybody laughs at, you know, the bullying like that, but also to kind of, um, you know, show the bullies that they're not going to get away with it. Uh, next slide. And so this one is, you know, I have to say I didn't edit their grammar, which is killing me, but so instead of losing some weight, so people aren't ap appealed by her unhealthy land whale ass, she tries to change millions of years of male evolution. Normal people are never going to want to fuck you, regardless of how much you complain. And I, I look just like him. Like I Google imaged him, you know, and this image and the original image came up. So, I mean, like the, the level of craft and detail that's involved in recreating them, as much as they look like characters, they are spot on to the actual people. Um, next, um, this woman, um, dozens of selfies of herself um, with her tattoos and the, you know, so I recreated her tattoos using inkjet um, tattoos and the one on her chest is, you know, a hand drawn. I mean, that's a, what I figured out was a zombie apocalypse tattoo over a spider web, janky spider web tattoo. So in other words, I don't have to call them out. I don't have to put their name out there. Hopefully one day they're scrolling through the internet and they say, oh, that's me, you know, and you know, that's it. Um, and I think some people are so narcissistic, they'll think it's them and it's not. Um, next slide. Um, 13 to years old to 70 years old is basically the age range. So fat shaming is a thing um, because they're the weaker in society, only uh, human to treat them worse. And so if you see me um, wearing a shirt that has like an icon or a symbol or the Speedos, um, those are the actual, like I actually found the Speedos or the clothing that they were wearing in their profile photo. And I think that's the last one. But um, yeah, okay. 
<laughs> there's, um, there's lots of, um, it's quite interesting because Hayley, your, your work just suddenly reminded me of all those like amazing uh, internet meme profiles that have kind of come off the back of like body shaming and you've got people like Tova Lee and, and obviously like Celeste Barber, like they'd never necessarily call themselves artists, but they're, you know, they're kind of what they're doing is, you know, similar, it's, it's sort of performance art. It's just that their dissemination is almost exclusively on the internet and, and, and it's a slightly, you know, their, their choice of where they sort of show the work is not necessarily within sort of that kind of arts institutional space, but, you know, it's no, no less kind of advocating for similar things to what you're sort of advocating for. Um, right. I, with Haley's work, th th those people, uh, it's all humour. And Haley's is, I mean, when I show that work in, in, in fairs or when we had the, you know, people who were walking through the booth at a fair were not, they don't, they didn't come there to see it. So they're more, less suspecting. So it was, it was so interesting. I love watching people at fairs because, so with Haley's, with this work, people would be, first of all, they'd see it and because it looks funny, they'd start laughing and go <laughs> look at that because she she's deliberately doing these caricatures and making herself look comical and funny and then they'd kind of come up closer then they'd read it then they'd understand and by the end of it i have people crying in the booth so i think that what Haley does is so powerful because it just it's not what you think it is and you and you by the time you kind of confound your own you know first uh, first um, impressions what you think you're looking at and then it just, it makes you think. And I think that when Hayley first started doing this work with Weight Watchers and then the Bully Pulpit, it was, it was like this kind of portent because it's all happening now. Everyone's getting bullied online. Everyone's got issues. And, and Hayley, she always gets told, oh, you're so brave, you're so strong. And because bullies are supposed to break you and people are like leaving, the, the, leaving Instagram and people can't cope with it. And I just, I just love, Haley's way of dealing with it is it's laughing it's humor and it's so strong and it is going to be around forever until you know the servers melt it's interesting you talk you know in, in identity in different ways and you talk about the humor uh, of Haley's work where you know Othello your work you know it, it, it deals I think men have a different way of, of of coping with things the challenges that men have today of what their masculinity is what's expected to, uh, of them, what the lad culture, you know, particularly the lad culture that, you know, is being questioned now, you know, it's, it's, it's not okay to grow up a woman. It's not okay. And men, I think, are, are lost in where their identity is. I think that's what I was saying to you, that, that, that outside of the whole project, is that you're just talking about where the humour comes from Haley's work. Because what the, comes from my work is not just the masculinity project, but the other project, is, comes with the discussions that I have with men or women that come to me and see the work and may engage with it aesthetically at first, and then they come to me and they open up conversations that they wouldn't normally have. And like I could say, when we're talking about this whole um, moving, photo moving photography and forward, and I was talking, and I came into this to talk about sort of like mixed media as well, because I think like shows like I went to documentary in 2017 and there was photography and installations. It just wasn't photography, it was an installation around it. And when I look at the show, it autograph, I mentioned, and just to relate that to the, the photography, which also gives where I had lots of men coming for it and lots of women coming, to, privately wanted to have discussions after seeing this image, not necessarily in public, but privately, in the same way when I use the paintings, I had a discussion with, which kind of relates to the masculinity, like I met a guy who sells newspapers at Farringdon Station and he said when he wanted to do painting when he was um when he was when he was 21 people started calling him said because he was in a different sort of culture he wasn't from an arty family from a very working class family people were calling him gay and if you relate that to the kind of masculine point these are the conversations and when i said to him well, you know we we're talking about my paintings and he was relating to it i can also relate to the masculinity because here we were having these conversations through the work that can open up and that's why i was um how people engage with the work. So it's a bit more serious, but it's those private conversations that happens. Because men would never come forward and start talking about him in front of the people or some of the women that wants to have well, conversations with me. The, 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 you know, the trends and the, the, the direction, because I think 
Haley, both you and Othello, um, you, you have a, a tremendous focus on, on, on the subject matter, you know, and the interpretations uh, uh, of it. And, and you talk, particularly both of you are talking about everyone, as, as a matter of fact, uh, of the impact of what social media has and, and how, you know, like you were saying earlier, Othello, about uh, there's many photographers out there and their whole audience is on Instagram and so on. So it's not at Tate Modern and it's not at smaller. Yeah, because you know, they wouldn't get included in those places, but they have, uh, because they haven't been included in those institutions, they're finding other ways of um, finding their own audience and putting their work out there. Because those people wouldn't be necessarily included in those sort of institutions. Well, let me ask, you know, Fiona, looking outward and, you know, you've been in the industry, you know, 20, about 20 years. I know you're only, 17 and three quarters because I'm <laughs> five eights. Or Just like good that. lighting. <laughs> but, but you know, these, these last years, particularly, what do you see rising up? What do, what do you see uh, 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 as a, 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 a trend uh, uh, that because of the impact of medium or, or technology and so on, what, what, what are you seeing coming up? I think probably the most notable thing that I've noticed is that agency. It's that representation of who's telling whose story and people responding much more to documenting that their lived experience. You know, I think people are much more interested in, in or, you know, I hate the word authenticity, but you know, I'd much rather know about what it's like to be a black South African from a black South African than I would want to know it from, you know, someone that's gone there and spent three weeks and then sort of claims that they're going to be an expert in that subject like that that they're the sorts of stories that I think are are, are, are coming up more and more now that's I think we're starting to see people um directly in, in a way directly um what's the word reject um work that's by you know non non-authentic authors let's say um I think that's probably one of the biggest things I've I've noticed that's something I welcome wholeheartedly. Mm. Hannah, what do you think? Um, well, I was just thinking earlier about when you were saying um, confounding people's expectations of, you know, the of, of, of women being objectified. And and I think it's still really exciting. There's, I mean, Fiona as well is very involved with this. A lot of kind of female voices are really still got a lot to say and uh, and I remember when an, another art fair story is when I show Juno Calypso, who I work with, and people always think that her work is taken by a man. And then they have no idea it's a, a woman on her own doing everything. She's not just taking the photo, she's like the actress, model, director, hair, makeup, you know, lighting. She's like everything on her own. So I think that, I mean, what's what's happening now is we're coming out of lockdown pandemic and it's going to be I think it's going to be a period of great creativity and I'm interested to see what happens in terms of in photography what how what how is that manifested because yesterday I was reading about fashion it's all about fun everyone wants fun it's mini skirts you know and I'm wondering okay what what does because I, I did skirts. hey there you go Carol's ahead of the trend always but I have to say, I did have a slight aversion to, I thought lockdown projects are gonna be just everywhere, rife. And and I kind of thought, I'm not, I'm not really interested in, in hearing or seeing them. First of all, because I felt like I was too close to it. I was too in it and I needed like a bit of distance. And second of all, because I thought that everyone has had such an intense experience then it's either gonna be not interesting because everyone's had it themselves or it's going to, be the opposite and it's actually going to be relevant and engage people but there's already projects I'm seeing which are interesting like Sean Davies just um doing one in her garden with all these you know they've sold, sold her and her son sowed this kind of beautiful wild garden and things like that and obviously Othello's work with his father um you know there there are some interesting things but I'm you know, I'm interested to see the how 
how how the innovation the creativity i'll just say one more quick thing <laughs> because in terms of publishing the last time we had a real you know renaissance surge was after the financial crash in 2008 and that was because all of the publishers were thought that was it not this is the nail in the coffin to the to the physical art book but all the kids started wanting to make books and that is the only only reason it was because there was a recession and that fed innovation and then all the young people wanted to make books so we'll see what happens i mean we've got another big world crisis i I've got to say that i spoke to quite a few young people this week and quite a lot of them are into found images it's quite uh, a few of them. surprisingly enough we're talking about found um finding images and doing work around found images like, like i said found images yeah it was like, it's lo-fi stuff it's with publishing it was like photocopying making zines and i think the found image is like that is accessible it's it's nearby it doesn't you don't need huge production values to make it it's like it's a ready made ooh interesting we'll see but, but that's that's an interesting thing when you say you know found found images and particularly if you can personalize it by you know old I- images that you have at home that maybe you didn't print and so on and how you can contemporize it and because of the technology that's available today, you know, you can do montages. It's not a very sophisticated thing. There's some very basic things that you can you can do. And you know, Haley, you know, so much of what you do, uh, aside from reflecting on on, on what's happening uh, from the social social impact of it, is related also to your performance. You know, you set it up, you research it, and and, and so on. And in going to get galleries today, and I'd love everyone else's view in terms of the trends that you know you witness is that most galleries now, not most, I should say, gall- the good galleries, you know, the, the installations they do uh, 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 have other things just aside from frame picture on, on, on a wall. There's a videos. It's a different way of presenting ideas to engage to engage the viewer, and I I, I think you know with two gallerists sitting sitting here and, and a fellow, the, the gallery, you know, with the autograph that I, I saw. Yeah, I've got a painting and I've got a film in there. I didn't, get, I didn't get to the painting part and the presentation, but in the exhibition, I've got a painting and, and, uh, and like well, I said, a film. I want, I want, I want to do, why don't we just cut for a few moments? <laughs> I just want to say, you're talking about different ways of curating. There was a really interesting exhibition in 2018, 13 at the uh, Le Ball Gallery in Paris and it was called the Anticorp and they had like work all over the walls they didn't just put it on in frames they were paint they were everywhere so that's one of my paintings um well they talk about you know because your evolution because you uh, in the first a, a small exhibition i think it was over the summer when we had a small lock uh, break from the lockdown you had in, in that show you had oil paintings because you 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 sketch you, you you paint you make films and you shoot well i think that's what it, well if you speak to a lot of people it's like um like multimedia i also do some teaching and this year i've had never had so many students saying they wanted to work across uh, different mediums rather than just mm-hmm. working in one medium they wanted to work across things so i think that's quite trendy was quite that's happening quite now at, at the moment so obviously these paintings are Mike, can I- can I just ask you um, why you feel the need to sort of do multi multidisciplinary approach to stuff? I never feel that I wanted to ever. Um, just for me, I never would have wanted to. Um, One medium creativity because it translates. Sometimes I've um, work will translate with a photograph. Sometimes mm-hmm. it translates better with with um, a film, and then some things it just translates through. I think in a way, my paintings are like a a release. Because obviously the photography is it's very planned, like I'm working on the project now and I'm working on it for the last two years, but I had lockdown, so I couldn't get 50 people into a space. So the paintings became sort of like visual diaries of emotions. So while I'm in between making, the, in between doing these projects, I just take a lot of plan, a lot of research, I'm creating these paintings. There's also another way of expressing um, my creativity, because I never felt like, I was ever really a photographer. That was one medium, but I've always wanted to explore other mediums. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think. Yeah. Sorry, 
I just said so, um, when we first started, I, I sort of pointed out, I, I sort of feel like a lot of artists feel like working with one kind of medium feels quite reductive or, or doesn't quite speak to the whole kind of story. Um, and that's why lots of people are now crossing over into, you know, sculpture and different media yeah. art or video or, yeah, I just, yeah, just wondered what your- Sometimes a project relates, will translate better as a photograph and sometimes it just doesn't work as a photograph. It works better as a painting or a or a or, or a film. Yeah. Well, I, th I think you know what, what we're talking about. It it it, 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 it the trends is uh, I'm witnessing it, and I'd love to, uh, to have your views. It's much more dynamic. It isn't just short, you know, frame pictures hanging on a wall sequence in a particular way. You know, th there's installations that are, are, are created. You know, the, the show it autograph you know that you're mm. in with 10 different other artists uh, the way it's curated by Renee Mousse who was the curator at autograph uh, it, it makes you think and it, it's it, it has so many different textures and elements to it and you know Hannah and, 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 and Fiona you both have galleries I mean how, how are you looking at the curation of, of the work of the artists you represent now yeah, it's unusual that a photographer or an artist comes in now and just does a room full of prints. I think those days are kind of gone, but um, no, but with Haley's show, we did uh, about three big blow ups and the rest prints and frames because I don't think her work is, is already incorporating performance. So it doesn't need to be a, a sculpture or, a, you know, but um, yeah, I'd say that there's uh, there's a lot of, I mean, what I like about having a physical gallery space is seeing how every single exhibition is different and you work with the artists and then they come up with something that's innovative and, and interesting. And that's kind of why I love doing exhibitions. Um, but I was just thinking about when, when um, the Aperture of Paris Photo Book Awards were being announced a few years ago and Sean Davy had just um, been a finalist for Looking for Alice and and Leslie Martin from Aperture was, she was going through all the kind of finalists and she was saying, now this book is really good because of the design of this. And this has been, this book is really interesting because of its innovative use of shape and color. And she was basically giving a kind of description about why each book was good. And then she got to Sean's book and she goes, and sometimes they're just damn good photos. And I was like, <laughs> It's oh, it's sometimes it just is they good photos. You don't need to do all the, you know, other stuff. And, uh, 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 well, yeah. So, like, um, I actually got to to photography through other mediums. So I, I studied ceramics, printmaking, photography, um, at the undergraduate and postgraduate level. And I know, I mean, I teach photography. I love photography. But basically, whenever I have an idea, it's like a problem that I try to solve. And when I'm working with my students, it's trying to get like the absolute kind of best way to articulate exactly what you're trying to say. And sometimes that's with a camera and sometimes it's with a camera, you know, a print plus some other media. And sometimes it's it's not. And that's kind of, you know. I haven't done anything in clay in many, many, many years, but I know it's there. Um, if I ever need it. So it's, I think it just kind of, if anything, it builds more confidence and being able to kind of, um, like I use that kind of three-dimensional language when I'm working with my students. And when I think of shows and when I think of books and the way I want the work presented, I definitely think three-dimensionally. And the, you know, basically the viewer's experience ultimately. I think as well, there's, there's a lot of excitement coming out of, well, let's say pre-COVID, but, um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity that the smaller commercial galleries are being much more experimental. I mean, it's, you know, mm -hmm. obviously it's easy to point fingers at the big institutions and say that they're, you know, that they're not doing enough. But, you know, I think about like what TJ Bolting's done over the last 10 years and, and it's, it's had some of the most exciting exhibitions in London. And that's because Hannah's really good at working with her artists to use, to use the space. So I think that's, that's a thing that you don't tend to see so much at the, at the larger institution level, because, you know, you're going to be given, I don't know, the turbine hall. It's a bit, you know, it's a bit overwhelming, but when you're working with, when you're working with smaller commercial galleries and there is that opportunity to experiment a little bit more, you, you see some really exciting stuff. I mean, Hannah's program 
this year has been absolutely wild. Like you, you just you wouldn't see that kind of work and anywhere else. And I think that that's also something that we're we're seeing now is that you know that the people that are doing interesting stuff are not necessarily you know at the at the top top level of the institutions. It's much more you know dynamic and flexible and. You know, I mean, I think about the stuff that we do at Weber as well. It's it's much more sitting at that in intersection of sculpture, installation, how you use the space. Um, you know, working with like young artists like Theo Simpson. You know, it's it's or Daniel Shea. You know, th these guys are not. They're informed by a different background. You know, Daniel's from a painter and sculpture background. Theo is you know trained graphic design, and you know he's he's using different materials and. So I think that there's just a bit of a, yeah, a bit of a sort of pushback against this kind of very prescriptive way of doing things, whether that's on the kind of curatorial front or installation front or, or from the artists. Mm. It's certainly more dynamic, I, I, I think, in terms of, you know, the trends is, you know, how do you step out and, and, and show the work? And, and, you know, big institutions like, you know, a, a, a Tate and, and a v and a, you know, they, they, they have, they're massive and they have so many, so many layers uh, 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 of uh, different decision makers at different levels and, and, and so on. And is this acceptable to a wider audience? And what if a four year old walks in and sees a naked, I don't know what, and so on, where I think a smaller gallery has greater flexibility and that's where you're seeing the trends percolate and, 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 and come yeah. up. And, and so on. institutions move much they move really slowly the, the icebergs of, of, of change as it were the, um, and, and they have different kinds of as we know they have different kinds of uh, budgets i think a smaller gallery and independent you know they they have to be more creative uh, uh, and to optimize what budgets they've got to be able to pull together you know uh a, a, a show. It isn't like okay, we've got one million to do this and ten million to do that. You know, it's like okay, we've got ten pounds now. How are we going to make that stretch and also serve some decent rosé wine when people come and visit? And things. <laughs> oh, Han Hannah's always been very good at that. Yeah, always. We know <laughs> definitely. You never, you never go to the gallery without having a glass in your hand, and she's there at the door. Didn't you get yours yet? You never go past it, TJ Bolton. That is absolutely. Trend, please don't change that trend. I really like that. No, 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 no. So you know, it just, just to bring some things to to coalesce uh, uh, together. Um, I'd like each of you just in a very short, sharp way, and you don't have to, uh, it, but if you can, what do you think, looking in your little crystal ball or your big crystal ball, what the most important trend that you see coming up? Uh, uh, uh. Anyone? Someone jump in? <laughs> oh, I mean, I think risk takers and, you know, people who are, you know, willing to kind of create their own spaces, you know, kind of, you know, going off what Othello said earlier, I think people kind of got sick of all the air being sucked out of the room by the same old people. So they just went and found another room. Yeah. yeah. I think that, I say a lot of work, people be more true to themselves, just making the work that they feel that, um, not thinking about what well, does it fit into a gallery? Does it fit into but to being true to being true to the work that they truly want to make. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I'd say it's also like that that gatekeeper relationship between creator and let's call it commissioner um, is changing as well. I think I think there's a bit more of a level playing field and there's pe people asking questions about, you know, where the work's coming from and who's making the work. Um, and I think like Haley says, you know, there's so many amazing grassroots um, groups that are coming out of, you know, um, like Photographers Green Book just launched, like that's an amazing new initiative. You know, all these things that are kind of coming out of necessity and the lack of space for those things that exist in that sort of mainstream space that is coming up from this much more kind of underground grassroots space as, as art has always done. And then it becomes mainstream, so. But you know, do you not say that what has really kick this off in a much wider way is everyone's a photographer today. People, whether it's an iPhone or whatever appliance that they're using, everyone is taking pictures 
and the freedom of, of, of having what social media, the positive part, let's say, of some, some aspects of the social media, posting your things on Instagram, you have different viewers, people are looking at things in a different, I'm not talking about the negativity of how many likes do you have or, and, and, and so on, as the, a, an important impact uh, uh, that has uh, fueled the energy uh, of the category. Well, and I also think that like, because of that, people, you know, oftentimes don't, you know, they think about what they want to do with the camera versus being a photographer. Like I stopped messing around and I don't, don't put photo on my business card. I've just put provocator because I'm like, you know, like just cut to the chase um, because with the word photographer comes all this kind of embedded other language that I'm generally not interested in. And uh, yeah, I, I can put that. I actually agree with that. I grabbed totally. Sorry. Yeah, we, we have someone that wants to go live and ask a question. So instead of cutting them off, we haven't even got into any kind of Q and A's. So it's Nick Stewart. Hi, Nick. Hi, Nick. Hi, Nick. Okay, let me see. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Hear you? Yeah, I'm not so I'm not so sure I want to ask questions. They're, they're, I've been making comments on your Q and A thing. Uh, I mean, some of them have been addressed, but I still think we underestimate the impact of the internet. Uh, and, and I think particularly on hierarchies and the kind of language we use to discuss art and activism and so on, it seems increasingly to me that the language itself is, is being hollowed out by social media and so on. That, that there's so, so much that we've taken for granted about the way the art world works and the, the different uh, systems we have, of galleries and museums and so on. And I think we underestimate the impact of what is actually happening now. And I, I just feel increasingly that the old language that we use to, to describe professional activities, the photographer and the artist and so on, are increasingly redundant because millions of, and it's not just kids, but yes, it is, a lot of them are young people, are just not, <laughs> they're not interested in that. They, they've got a whole visual culture going on, uh, and not just visual, audiovisual that is incredibly, is just growing incredibly exponentially and it's just bypassing the art world and the professional world. So I, I think we underestimate the impact this is gonna have. Yeah, I mean- A lot of what we've taken for granted. I mean, like every, so interviewing students, working with students, they wanna make a social impact. Um, interesting, they wanna get in the dark room and they wanna to travel internationally and they wanna make a social impact. Um, and so, to be able to help them do that with a camera and it's like whatever audience and using the internet and you know kind of figuring out a way to be successful at that is absolutely key i suppose i'm meeting students that are coming from foundation level and they're already engaged with the social media already and already have an, um, a social media presence for their work um they're not they, they may be going to do like a foundation but they've already come with a whole uh, set of followers, the work they're producing, they're already doing it on the internet. Um, and I'm talking about students who just come straight from school into foundation. Yeah, it's like the internet, they want it to function more. Like, you know, it's not just about followers and likes and things like that. They want like, they want to make like an impact. Mm. Um, I, that's what I've noticed. So it's, um, it's great. It's great to watch and help. So. Well, I, I think we've come a full circle. Uh, this has been such a, a fun evening uh, with you. Thank you so much for spending a Friday night together. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and it's not even lockdown. We can all be going out and boogieing on down and doing everything else. So thank you, wonderful panel, uh, for a very lively and interesting conversation. And. Um, uh, watch this space. I think, you know, there's so much to talk about, about trends in the 21st century and what's happening and, 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 and so on. And particularly, uh, uh, as uh, Nick had just said, yeah, was, I don't think any of us are, have underestimated the power of the internet. I think all of us are acutely aware of it, in the good and the bad and, and the ugly. So thank you everybody uh, that has uh, signed uh, up uh, uh, today. Uh, just to remind everyone uh, that uh, we uh, have this series uh, the first Thursday of every month, so we will be announcing what our next show will be on. And I want to particularly thank you for uh, Pranvera Smith, 
who is, is the backbone and uh, uh, is the founder uh, uh, of these uh, talks. And she's invited me to be a part of it. Uh, she does have mostly photojournalistic uh, in very serious subject matter and so on. And some bit of fun and there you go. Canberra, thank you so much for having uh, all of us and uh, have a lovely weekend, uh, everybody. And I'll see you all soon. Bye. Thank you, bye. everyone. Thank you. Bye. Nice to meet everyone.